Hey everyone, my name is Abul Kapoor and I'm back to talk a bit more about graph neural networks. So at this point, you've heard a bit about what GNNs are and how they can be applied. In this talk, I'm gonna dive into scaling GNNs and specifically some of the research we've been doing to scale GNNs up to multi-million and billion node graphs, You know, the kind of data that you might actually see at Google. So thanks again to all of you guys who are still tuned in and uh, let's get started. So most of this presentation is based on this paper titled Scaling Graph Neural Networks with Approximate Page Rank. And I really wanna give a shout out to the two first authors here, Alexander and Johannes. This is really their idea, their brainchild. Uh, and I'm gonna try and do justice to this paper in this presentation. Uh, but I really think that you guys, if you have the time, you should check it out, either by going to that archive link or just doing a Google search for the title, it should pull up. It's a really cool piece of work. Um, and it's really exciting to be able to present it here at this, at this uh, workshop. So let's start with a little bit of background. First, a quick recap of what GCNs are. Graph convolutional networks are a way of incorporating graph context into the embeddings of a specific node. Uh, using stacked GCN layers, we can build up a hierarchical representation of a graph the same way we might do with uh, image pixels on a convolutional network. So because each part of the graph convolution is learned, we can utilize node neighborhoods to make smarter decisions in a pretty wide range of tasks, which ends up making GCNs a really flexible and really powerful part of the graph mining toolbox. And we use these things all across Google as a result. So the traditional GCN operates by converting the adjacency of a graph into a matrix, and then using that adjacency matrix as a gather operation to select and average one hot neighborhoods. Now that adjacency matrix is an N by N matrix where N is the number of nodes. So you might immediately see a problem here. If N is small, you know, if you're working on a small graph that maybe has like a few thousand or tens of thousands of nodes, this is totally fine. But when you start working with real world data where you might have millions or even billions of nodes, suddenly that adjacency matrix ends up becoming way too large. Uh, if you have an, a million node graph, then that adjacency matrix represents a million by a million float vectors, or I should say floats, which is just way too much to actually store in memory at any, in, on a single machine. Um, so we actually need to do something different in order to solve this for really, really large graphs. Uh, and I think the most popular approach to solve this problem is to sample patches of the graph or to create subgraphs and then train on those patches instead. This is actually pretty effective. Uh, even though you are approximating what the underlying GCN is trying to do, that approximation ends up not actually impacting the, um, the accuracy of the approach that much. Uh, and it allows us to actually use this approach on a much larger uh, set of data, which is really cool and really practical. Uh, but this still poses some key challenges. So the first one is uh, has to do with recursive message passing. So the traditional GCN relies on a recursive message passing from a node to its neighborhood. If I wanna calculate the embedding for that seed node, I need to calculate the embeddings for its neighbors and its neighbors' neighbors and its neighbors' neighbors' neighbors. And when everything is just stored on memory, when your adjacency matrix is small enough to be able to be stored on memory, that's fine because that you can, you can operate on the entire thing at one go just by doing a, an efficient matrix multiplication. But if your data is stored on disk, if your graph is too large to actually store in memory and you have to store it in disk, then suddenly all of those gathering operations end up being IO lookups. And that becomes really expensive because in the real world, a node might have 64 neighbors and each one of those nodes might have 64 neighbors. And suddenly you're doing a lot of IO lookups just to calculate a single node embedding. So that's just not scalable for real world data at all. The second big problem is graph convolutional networks bake in this assumption that all neighboring nodes are useful for the final computation. And in practice, empirically, that's just not true. Uh, GCNs end up being effective in part because they are kind of scattershot. They train over all of the neighboring nodes and the GCN ends up picking up the most important nodes by default and devaluing all of the other ones. But this also has some problems with scalability. In the real world, you might have celebrity nodes that have thousands of neighbors. And so then you're left with one of two options. Either you're doing a lot of calculation that just doesn't matter because the node is gonna unvalue or devalue those nodes anyway. Uh, sorry, the model is gonna devalue those nodes anyway. Or you have to do some kind of random sampling scheme where you might end up missing the nodes that actually provide the important context that the model needs to learn something about the seed node. So that also isn't great from a scalability perspective. So PPRGo was our answer to these two problems. In this section, we're gonna talk about some of the insights that drive PPRGo and the underlying technologies. And we're gonna talk about how PPRGo works end to end as a single model. So there's two key insights here. The first is that calculating aggregations at runtime is really slow. You know, you have to be in TensorFlow, uh, you have to have something that's like end to end distributable, and it just doesn't really work. But there might be mechanisms for separating that aggregation beforehand. If we can pre-calculate aggregations offline, we might be able to save a lot of the runtime. Uh, and we might be able to use other approaches that are a lot more efficient than what we're currently doing, which is just you know sampling the, the, the graph. 
Uh, the second key insight is whatever aggregation mechanism we use should weight the nodes by their importance. In other words, we don't want to blindly aggregate our node neighborhoods. There should be some sort of a dial that allows us to say, OK, I only want to grab the top and most important nodes for some definition of importance. And I think the personalized page rank really neatly or really elegantly solves both of these problems. So a quick review of what personalized page rank or PPR actually is. For every node, we calculate the stationary distribution of a random walk with some teleport probability. And this gives us a weight neck vector for the node's neighborhood. Nodes that appear frequently in these random walks are weighted higher than nodes that rarely appear. So to just try and build some intuition from an information perspective, if you have a really large random walk size, you can think of this as an infinite hop attention vector, where the nodes that ends up being uh, end up being really, really frequent in the random hop, um, or I should say in the random walk, are um, weighted much higher in the underlying attention vector for a given seed node. So how do we actually calculate PPR? Well, there's two ways. The first one is this nice, highly scalable, distributed way uh, called ACL's algorithm that we can run offline in parallel with model training. And this is a really useful algorithm when you have to calculate a PPR vector and use it multiple times over and over again. Like, for example, when we have training. Uh, because during training, a single node ends up getting used multiple times. It ends up getting used, uh, obviously, for when itself is a seed node, like when that node is its own seed but also when it appears in all of the different subgraphs of all of the other nearby nodes. So PPR, uh, is, is, ACL's algorithm is really efficient for calculating PPR in that, uh, in that setting. During inference, though, we only need PPR vector once. So it's actually more efficient to fall back to power iteration, which is this tried and true method for calculating PPR uh, using this recursive calculation of this equation. You can actually see the power iteration equation on the right. Um, it's expensive when you have to use a lot of different iterations to get an accurate representation of PPR. But we found during inference that we actually only need to do one to three iterations in order to get a reasonably uh, effective PPR vector that will actually serve its purpose. So that's great. So we have two methods of calculating PPR that are both really efficient uh, and will allow us to actually speed up our aggregation significantly. So this actually gives us all the pieces necessary to create PPR Go. First, we calculate the PPR vectors offline at scale uh, using ACL's method. Then we train a simple MLP model that ingests the node features and outputs logits. And this is actually happening in parallel with the page rank pipeline. We can aggregate these logits using the attention weights of the top k nodes in the PPR vector. Because remember, PPR allows us to sort these nodes based on how important they are uh, using these random walk uh, frequency distributions at the proxy. Uh, and then we can use that aggregation to calculate a loss, which then will create gradients and backpropagate through the rest of the model. Uh, and so that those first three steps are training, which allows us to kind of you know efficiently and scalably train uh, in a very distributed way. At inference, we use power iteration with two to three iterations to calculate an approximated PPR vector. And then that vector is fed into the model with the node features to produce a final prediction. So this allows us to run everything end to end at scale in a fairly efficient way. If I had to describe PPR in one sentence, I would say PPR Go aggregates the most important nodes in the n hop neighborhood using only one hop of computation. And n can be arbitrarily large. It can be 2, it can be 3, it can be 5, it can be 10. As n increases, uh, you know, obviously, there's going to be an increase in runtime. But because we aren't doing this recursive message passing, it's going to be much, much lower of an increase compared to all of the other methods that we normally would use. So let's talk about some of the results. There are two key questions that we want to answer here. First, what was the trade-off between accuracy and scalability? And this is a really important question, because if it turns out that PPR Go just tanks the accuracy of a model, we might not want to use it, even if it ends up being really scalable. The second big question was, what was the resource consumption of PPR Go compared to other methods? And to answer that, we measured the runtime as a sum of the pre-processing, the training, and the inference. But then we also memory, uh, measured things like memory usage and, of course, the accuracy. We trained PPR Go and our baselines on a few sparsely labeled semi-supervised node classification tasks. And some of these data sets might look familiar. Quora and PubMed are really popular in the um, adjacency matrix stored in memory setting, uh, where you have everything stored on a single machine. Reddit is uh, order of magnitude bigger. Um, and so we included that as kind of a sec as like a middle tier um, data set that we wanted to test the PPR Go on. But we actually felt that these were not really, lar uh, really large enough to really get a full sense of what PPR could do. So we also introduced a new data set called MAG uh, that was much, much larger than all of the other data sets. We'll talk a little bit more about MAG in a second, but I want to just basically explain that the reason we introduced this data set was to make sure that we were actually testing the thing that we wanted to test, which was can PPR Go work on Google scale data? So let's start with the academic data sets. This is a, uh, this is a runtime analysis and accuracy, accuracy analysis of running PPR Go and the baselines on a single machine using 20 times the number of node classes for training. 
Uh, so what that means is, you know, Quora has seven different classes. So for Quora, we are using 140 uh, nodes for training. I think what's really impressive here is that PPR Go shows comparable accuracy and scales much better to large data sets than its competitors. So like, you know, on Quora and PubMed, I think everything is roughly about the same. The accuracy numbers and the speeds are all kind of comparable. But for Reddit, where you have an order of magnitude increase in size, suddenly PPR Go is the only method that still retains this really, really fast approach. It's two orders of magnitude faster than all of the baselines that we uh, that we looked at. Um, and there's no trade-off in accuracy. Actually, in some cases, PPR Go looks like it did much better in accuracy than the, um, the opposing uh, methods. So we wanted to dive a little bit further into the Reddit uh, Reddit test because it's you know it's a single machine, and we want to actually see how well it does uh, in each of the individual steps compared to some of our baselines. And we see that you know even though uh, PPR Go uh, is much much faster, its accuracy is pretty much exactly the same as all of the other approaches, and it requires much less memory at pretty much every step. Uh, throughout. So uh, this is actually really, really promising because on this small data set, on these really small data sets, uh, we're able to see that PPR Go significantly outperforms in terms of runtime, but there's no meaningful cost in accuracy. So it kind of answers that first question, at least on these smaller data sets. But we don't necessarily care that much about the smaller data sets. PPR Go was designed to work on real world graphs. That was the problem that we were trying to solve. And most of these academic graphs are actually really small. Like even Reddit, which has a few hundred thousand nodes, is just not a reasonable comparison to the kind of data that we see every day at Google. So we created a novel data set that we wanted to open source so that other folks uh, who are in the graph learning community can test their approaches on this large scale data problem. The MAG data set has 12 million nodes and 173 million edges, and it has 2.8 million node features. And while that's still probably a little bit less than the kind of data that we might see on the upper end at Google, it's starting to get close to Google scale. It's certainly large enough that we wouldn't be able to store the entire adjacency matrix in memory, which you could reasonably do with even up to the Reddit graph. So it's worth noting that on a single machine, PPR Go is the only method that actually finishes training on the MAG data set. Um, and it, even then, it finishes in less than two minutes, which I think is really, really impressive. So like I said, we care a lot about the trade-offs. What is the accuracy versus runtime trade-off? Uh, and so we also care a lot about like the distributed setting, because that's actually the setting that we're going to be using PPR Go most often. Uh, and we can see here that the trade-off is actually really not that bad. Uh, when you have a, a kind of a low top K and a low epsilon, which corresponds to a fairly low number of runtimes or like a low, lower number of runtime cycles, we have a runtime of six minutes in a distributed setting compared to a runtime of 12 minutes uh, in kind of one of the more expensive settings. So you can very smoothly trade off the runtime versus accuracy here for PPR Go, which is actually really nice because it means that we have these dials that allow us to say, okay, how much, uh, you know, how much accuracy do I actually want to trade off for what percent of runtime? Uh, but we also wanted to check you know, how efficient the uh, actual runtime calculations were. So the accuracy for all of the measures uh, that we tested here was about the same, 61%. But the runtime characteristics were super different. So we looked at the efficiency per worker for each of the approaches that we wanted to analyze. And we looked at how these things actually traded off based on the number of neighbors. And we see that in both cases, the PPR Go was significantly more efficient and more effective than the other approaches that we were looking at. And this is actually a log scale. So when I say significant, I mean like this is actually an order of magnitude better, or in some cases, two orders of magnitude better than the other approaches. Like this is a really, really huge improvement uh, in the distributed setting, which I, I, again is like really, really promising. So I only have a minute and a half left, so I wanna leave you guys with some conclusions before I go. The first is that even though graph convolutional networks are really powerful because they allow us to incorporate these node neighborhoods, they do so in this expensive scattershot way that just doesn't really scale to real world data sets, uh, you know, where we have millions or billions of nodes in a single graph. And PPR Go is kind of an answer to this problem. It gives us the benefit of large neighborhood learning with the speed of a single hop GNN in a trivially distributed manner, because everything inside PPR Go is end to end distributable and is fully scalable. And so PPR Go, you know, we validated the fact that PPR Go can actually operate on these large scale graphs, including Google scale graphs. It was the only learning tool that we tested among all of the baselines that successfully completed the MAG dataset. And the MAG dataset is the largest public academic graph that we are aware of to date. And you know, we have used PPR Go inside of Google and it's been extremely effective and very efficient ever since we kind of did this research. And that's it. Uh, I really do you know, want to thank you all again for tuning in. Uh, please take a look at the original paper, Scaling Graph Neural Networks with Approximate PageRank. And I do want to give another shout out to all of the authors who are responsible for making that work possible. Uh, and again, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conversation, uh, rest of the conference. I hope you guys enjoyed this talk. And thanks again for tuning in.